Ponytails are not <laughs> reprehensible, everybody. <laughs> hey, everybody. Welcome to the Joy Spiracy Theory. Your buddy Basil here. Hello, hello, hello. I'm glad to be back. I hope you guys are excited for this next episode. I realize it's been a little while since the last one, but, um, you know, I was, I was... I was roaming the earth for a little bit, um, doing the Lord's work, and uh, now I'm back. I'm settled in, and uh, and we're getting going. The ball's getting rolling. We're back in action. Um, first of all, I want to thank everybody who supported the Patreon. You can find that at patreon.com slash the Joy Spiracy Theory. Uh, they recently changed their logo for those of you who care about those types of things, which is almost nobody. Uh, but thank you to Melissa, Jen, Benjamin, Tommy, Cody, Tom, Natalie, Sam, and Clara. They all uh, chose to support the Joy Spiracy Theory or increase their support from one number to a bigger number. And so that's very awesome of them. And especially during a time while I was out of town. And um, it was just really encouraging to get these emails to say that people still lo- love the show and want to listen to it more and wish there were more episodes. And I'm right there with you. So here we are. Thank you, all of you. Also, those of you who signed up for $5 or more, you can go ahead and send me your pets' names and they can sponsor an episode. And uh, if you were $10 or more, you can write out 100 words for me to read to give a shout out to someone or to advertise your business or do whatever you got to do, you get a hundred words to do it and I'll read it on the show. Do it, do it, do it now. Um, And you, you got to make sure to send me those because I forget to email you and ask you. So you're listening to this, you've supported the Patreon. So send me that info. Okay. All right, guys, we got a wonderful episode today. Uh, This is Angie. And Angie and I had a great time talking. There was some, there was a tornado that rip, rip, <laughs> ripped through uh, the middle of the interview, but that's okay. Um, we survived. We got in a bunker and we finished the episode under a table in the basement or the root cellar. That's where you go, I think. Anyways, we talk about all sorts of great stuff. I don't even know if I can list them all, um, but you're just going to find out. It's going to be awesome. And, um, oh, Enzo is uh, Angie's wonderful, wonderful little pooch who recently passed away before this episode. So we're going to dedicate this episode to Enzo. He's he's dogging around, doing dog stuff in heaven. Okay, here we go. Short intro. That was fun. Okay, let's keep it going right into the episode. Enjoy. Hello? There she is. Is this Angie? This is Angie. Hey, how you doing, Angie? This is this is this is Basil. It is. <laughs> that is so weird. I don't know if you were expecting this call or not. I've recently taken to just uh dialing random numbers and then interviewing them for two hours. Okay, well cool. Yeah. I've heard of you. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh how you doing today? What are you grateful for? Uh I am grateful I got Skype to work. That's I'm... that's a good one. I'm grateful for that <laughs> too. So we have we already have stuff in common. Yes, and I'm grateful that I sat in a little bit of silence with God. To remove the fear of being on your podcast. <laughs> I think I'm okay now. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say it seems like it worked. Seems like you're you're ready to go. You're confident. You've you've got all your jokes lined up. You've memorized a monologue that you're you're gonna just soothe us all with now. Nope, I put it all in the trash. <laughs> <laughs> well that's good. That's that's how I like to do it around here. Uh unscripted, baby. I do have a question. Okay. Am I talking am I talking loud enough and do I need to be holding my tablet really close to the Oh, you're doing it tablet style? No, you sound great. You you sound good. Okay. You you know the the only other thing that people like to do to help is is have a headset of com- some kind or some sort of external microphone, but if you don't have that handy right now, then it's all good. You sound great. 
Okay, good, because I do not. Okay. Yeah, I don't really send uh, people a lot of uh, directions or warnings. And the, the, the only the one thing that I would say to listeners out there is if you got a headset, that it helps. I don't expect everybody to have a $35 million podcasting studio like me. um okay well that's so so you have you listened to the show before i have listened to your show great before great i love it great i listened to canary cry yeah i did not watch gonzo's um age of deceit ah yeah Oh. Until well into the canary cry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, we, Angie, we could have stopped at until. No, okay. I'm just kidding. Know, Everybody but... should watch that movie. It's wonderful. It's life-changing. <laughs> Let's rewind and stop it. <laughs> we'll fix it in post with all the heavy editing I do in these in these episodes. Yeah. Right, right. Which is none, unless, unless maybe, uh, unless maybe you reveal some deep dark secret that I need to call the police for. I might edit that one out. No, I'm pretty good at keeping those things under wraps. Okay, good. That's good to know, and it's good for anybody out there listening who may be a future partner in crime. Angie knows how to keep a secret. I do. So good that (laughs) she kept that a secret. Okay. Oh well, okay. So you know what's going on here. Um, you know, I, I, you sent me a message when you said you were available to uh, record an episode, and I've got some things to talk about. But first, let's let's get to know Angie a little bit. Let's. I want to know what's going on in that head of yours. Um, I like to start out with wh- where you where in the world generally. You don't have to give your whole PO box number. Or area code, <laughs> but uh, where are you? I'm in Wisconsin. All right. Um, I live in two places in Wisconsin. Two places is I'm, you got some sort of quantum uh, quantum separation going on. Yes. Okay. Some of the time I beam up to a place called Sister Bay in Door County. Okay. Which is like a very beautiful part of Wisconsin. That's great, you know. Otherwise, I've, I've never been to Wisconsin, but it sounds like it's it's a it's a secret little gem. I love it. <laughs> what was that other place that you're at? Um, other th- other than that, I'm in, I'm right between Milwaukee and Green Bay. Oh, those Not that anybody's gonna those, check the map. Those are some places that I know. I know those two places. So that might be those might be the only two places I know. Um, so okay, great. Wisconsin, what's up? Say hello to all your Wisconsin listeners, all your fans. Hey, Wisconsinites! I'm great, <laughs> grateful you're listening. <laughs> Is there some sort of like special Wisconsin term that I wouldn't know? Any turns of phrase that a that a West Coast boy might not know? Hmm. Well, a lot of people who come into Wisconsin want to eat a brat. Okay. Which is a brat. Brat. Oh, spelled boy. You say so, the funny words, don't you? You're one of those funny words places. And, of course, um, you hear a lot about cheese heads. Yeah, you know, I was actually going to say that. I don't even know if I had ever heard the team the term cheese heads, but I was just going to throw out cheese heads as I guess that's I guess if I've ever watched if anybody's ever watched Green Bay Packers, they know that. Yeah. So you eating any yeah. you eating any good cheese lately? Oh, yes. I love <laughs> cheese. <laughs> I almost let something slip. Oh. oh heck yeah. Yes. <laughs> You're just yes, so passionate about cheese. That's okay. That's what we all have right our now. own gifts. <laughs> yes, cheese is like my major protein. Well, that's not good. because I'm from Wisconsin, but because it's excellent. Yeah, nope. Nobody here is going to be complaining about cheese consumption. So we can just honestly, if we just talk about cheese for two hours, I think everybody will just be just fine with that. Uh, that being well, said, we'll we'll save some of the cheese talk for a little later. All right. <laughs> so, did you grow up there? How did you uh how did you grow up? How did you meet the Lord? What's give me your story, girl. 
All right. I grew up um, in Wisconsin and have lived here my whole life. I've done a little bit of traveling, but I'm always glad to be back uh -huh. in this area. I was born into a Catholic family. Oh. Um, I was raised in <laughs> I was raised in the Catholic Church, according to my dad, Ed. <laughs> What? It was not good. <laughs> so, oh, was, so according to your, he wasn't a fan. <laughs> no. he, well, he was, he had his own version. Yeah. And I believed in God since I was about five. And I wanted to please God since I was five. And in the childhood that I grew up in, God was, was, um, I was told that God was disappointed in me, and um, a favorite phrase my dad would say is, I don't know what I did for the, God to curse me with you devil spawns. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> so, Surely this was said in jest. No, it wasn't. Were you? Wasn't. Were, well, well, here's the real question. Were you acting as if you were little devil spawns? I can't claim I was perfect, but no, my parents were, um, they, the world wouldn't have seen it, but they were very mentally ill. Oh. My mother, borderline personality disorder, and it was a very violent childhood. Oh, yeah. And yikes. they drank, they drank to, which I believe was a coping skill. Yeah. Mechanism. Um, but it was it was a violent home, and I was actually, you know, a quiet girl who read a lot of books and tried to keep out of the way and tried to be really good. And I prayed to God all the time to make me a better person, to make my parents happy. And um, to shorten up the story, something really tragic happened. And I just told God, you know, forget it. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I hate you. I tore up <laughs> in my young adult life. I hope it's not an immortal sin, but I tore up many a Bible. <laughs> wow, just just an external God. expression of your feelings. Yeah, like, yeah. There, God. Yeah. But um, when I was about seventeen. Because I had decided I wasn't going to serve God, I started to look for other religions. Uh huh. And well, uh, okay. So uh -huh. real quick, real quick before we, because okay. we're only <laughs> we're only about nine minutes in. We got time, girl. Um, okay. But if if you don't, you know, if obviously I don't want to talk about anything you don't want to talk about. But well, would you mind? Uh, Maybe at least hinting at what what this was that happened that uh, changed your mind about God at the time? Not at all. Um, and just for your comfort, uh -huh. I have had a lot of counseling. And I have um, – I follow a program. Oh, well, that's good. We're definitely going to be talking about that. And I did want to come on and share my story because – uh, I've listened to so many podcasts and you guys are the ones of you like three or four that I really like. Yeah. Um, it always seems like, um, people were raised fairly well, although maybe that's an, that might not be true. Um, well, we all like to I, put that off, don't we? A lot of times we're trying to look as if we got it all together, but sometimes it really takes somebody asking the questions to really get it out. Yes, and I just want to share my story as uh, maybe like hope for someone who might be coming out of something like that. Yeah. Or just acknowledgement that, yeah, not all of us believers I uh, had this great awakening with Jesus and then life just turned into a perfect um, happily ever after because my adult life has been full of a lot of ups and downs and tests. But when I was a child, 
um, there were nine of us. Uh huh. And um, I had I was I was and still am kind of flaky. I have ADD. Yeah. And I had a sister that was um, two years older than me who used to kind of take care of me and make sure I didn't stop and pet a puppy on the way to school and be an hour late. Things like that. <laughs> Stop to pet a puppy. I'm like, when you said, I'm like, oh, that's not that bad. You can pet a puppy for an hour. Oh, yes, yes. And I think, um, well, yeah, but who doesn't want to pet a puppy for an hour? Well, but if you're I not going to pet for a full hour, what's the point? What's the point? Seriously. <laughs> And why have just one dog when you can have three? <laughs> yeah, th that's at least three good hours of puppy pet in a day. There you go. So anyway, the sister Monica was um, my protector. I looked up to her. She was my parents' golden daughter. Um, not that she didn't get equal amounts of abuse, but they really loved her as far as being the pride of the family. Yeah. And Monica was hit by a car by a drunk driver when she was 12. Oh no. When she was 12? Yeah. Yes. Wow. I was imagining a much older girl. No. She, well, this is like the getting from age 10 to age 17. But anyway, so my first real anger with God, this is actually where it starts because she was hit by a car and um, was brain damaged. Uh -huh. And nobody warned us when, okay, so my sister's in the hospital and I have a younger sister, Karen, and her and I would share a bed. And every night we would pray out loud asking God, to keep our sister alive and bring her back home. And I just felt very abandoned and lost that my sister wasn't around. And I was just like in a state of shock. Yeah, you had lost your, your what seemed to be your earthly protector. And maybe by age 10, I didn't need her in that respect as much. Sure. <laughs> but I really. You had, I cut, just, you had cut your puppy petting time down a little bit. Yeah. I kind of got a little more mature. Got it. Um, but so um, the after four months in the hospital, Monica came home and we were so excited. And I, you know, I just remember living in my head a lot. Like yeah. I didn't talk a lot, but I had all these thoughts. And I remember being so excited. Monica's coming home, you know, Life's going to go back to normal, um, you know, just the way it would be. How long was she in the hospital? Four months. Oh, that's a long time. That's that's not good. No, and her brain damage was pretty severe. And so she came home, and she was obviously different. And I'm 10, so I'm just sort of like, waiting for her to become normal and one day I you know probably like three or four days after she came home I asked my dad when is Monica going to be the way she used to be and he told me if you love her enough if you take her everywhere you go and include her in everything you do she'll get better what Dad, yes. you are not a doctor, man. Wow, that and, is... And so, so, being the good little people pleaser that I was, and of course wanting my sister and wanting to um, help the family, I was always praying for our family. You know, I took her everywhere I went, and I tried to include her in everything that I did, and Monica was... What happened to her brain was being exposed as long as it was. She flew through the air, landed on her head. Um, and the part of the brain that can reason 
um, was basically, I, I don't know the terminology, but she basically had the emotional abilities of up to a two-year-old. Wow. So, so it was almost like, I mean, it was like your guys' roles were reversed. Seemed like maybe now you had to be her protector a little bit. Yes. Or at least and her parent. I mean, if she's acting emotionally like a two years old, that's pretty tough. Well, things, things kind of started out like very hopeful and, um, with with my sister's brain damage, she knew who she was. She had all the memories she had. Um, but her personality became very angry, violent. So a two-year-old tantrum with a girl age 12 can be pretty violent. Wow. And my yeah, especially I, when she's like bigger than you. That could that could get like a dangerous situation. Yes. And she also had a lot of um physical impairment. So she she was just totally mentally and physically devastated. And after I realized this is the reality and my parents um I hope this doesn't sound like parent bashing. Um, my parents honestly believed, I have to think in my heart, they honestly thought this was going to help, but they thought they could beat the brain damage out of her. If they what? hit her heart. Yes. And so there was violence on a daily basis around my sister, Monica. Now was this, was it sort of like disciplinary? Like maybe they, they just got so frustrated with this child who had been sent even further back in her development. And it, it was like a disciplinary thing or was it like, again, daddy doctor being so, so wrong, dropping out of daddy doctor school and making some pretty bad prescriptions here. It was a mixture. Wow. <laughs> I think um, while my parents were verbally and physically and mentally abusive from the first child who is 16 years older than me down to my youngest sister who's four years younger than me, but having Monica injured in such a serious way halfway through their child rearing years did nothing to improve the situation, obviously. And when I realized this is what, this is what it is. Yeah. And I didn't have anyone to cry to. I didn't have, I used to go to school and I would be trying to hold back crying and I didn't even know why. Now, did, yeah. so, so I'm sorry. I, I just want to make sure I have the, if I remember the picture, how many sisters and brothers did you have? There were nine of us. So there was a whole gaggle, a whole gaggle of you kids. Yes. Now. Yes. There, there were the older ones. Yeah. And then us younger ones. <laughs> yeah. Was everybody kind of getting the same treatment or were, when they got older, what did they, uh, were they able to defend themselves or at least run faster than your foggy parents? Well, a couple, one brother went to juvie. Um, well, that's one way to get away. Another couple of them should have gone to juvie and didn't. And um, I ran away once, went to a foster home for a few days. And sadly, um, it was better to be at home. <laughs> really? Oh, my <laughs> goodness. Angie, I got to say, and please excuse me, I, I, you know, I'm very sensitive to being rude in certain situations, but this is crazy. This is like, I mean, this is like a movie, how horrible this was. Yeah, I like to say that if I wrote this movie, nobody, the producer would go seriously. Yeah, some, I mean, really, sometimes you watch these movies, you're like, well, 
this writer laid it on a little bit thick, but yes. that that's the real deal. Um, just one quick note, Angie. Uh, when you're moving around or moving the, the tablet around, I can hear some little crinkles and smudges. Um, so you can just be aware of that. That if, if you want, although okay. we could, although we could keep it in for flavor, you know, we got that real flavor on this show. Make it sound all old timey and whatnot. <laughs> yeah, I'll just put some <laughs> record scratches. <laughs> oh God, that'd be horrible. What if I started putting in sound effects whenever somebody said something shocking? It was like a <laughs> record scratch. No, okay. Very cool. All right, I'm sorry, cool. I went a little off track here. Um, so, oh my goodness. So, basically. It kind of seems like your brothers and sisters, everybody was kind of like every man for himself. And uh, yeah, yeah, just just trying to make it through, which is totally understandable. Were yes. you were you and close with your brothers and sisters? It can be kind of hard to be close when they're when you have one so uh, so much older than you. Um, I was not close with my siblings and um, most of them were out of the house before I really even got to know who they were. Yeah. Uh, the only person I really had was Monica. And I, um, she was the only sibling who did not feel like she needed to compete with me or put me in my place. Oh, wow. And when I realized through all those years of Praying, I would pray for, you know, God, please help me be good so my mom will smile. Um, I would pray on my way home from school that, you know, things would be okay when I got there. Monica was always kind of a steady, stable part of my life. And when I realized after all the praying I did that this is what God gave me, I thought, God, fine. You hate us. And you know what? I hate you too. And, um, I went through some rebellion. I decided I was going to dabble in the occult. Ooh, Um, Bubba. (laughs) Although I do believe in God and the devil and a few weird things happened with my friends and I, and it was like, okay, no. Are you talking, you you talking like Ouija board at a sleepover style or, you know, some like pentagrams in an abandoned house? No, no pentagrams. Okay. But astro travel. Oh yeah. Which, which somehow it was easier than I thought. And (laughs) I, I, Having my soul leave my body and fly around the astral universe easier than it sounds. (laughs) The book, well, a lot of times you'll, I will hear your guests or different people on podcasts say that books can have spells on them. And the first paragraph of the book that I was reading said, this is a dangerous practice and should not be done by yourself. And um, just this warning, and wow. then it proceeds to tell a tell a person how to go about astro traveling, and so I just did it. And wow! I mean, at least they gave you the disclaimer. I you got to give yeah. them props for that. At least they weren't <laughs> like, "Don't worry, this is totally chill. All the cool kids are doing it." Right. Yeah. So I didn't even know that I astro traveled until the next day. What, what, okay, when, you got to tell. You get, do tell. Okay. So the next day, I'm going downstairs to eat my breakfast before school. And now I'm 16, so the hitting and the stuff like that wasn't happening anymore. And once in a while, I would talk to my mom <laughs> if she seemed approachable. <laughs> I said, hey, Ma. So when are you and dad going out West? And she looked at me and she goes, you were eavesdropping on us. And I said, no, I wasn't. She goes, yes, you were. Nobody knows we're going to go out West. We just made that decision last night. And I'm like, what? 
I said, you told me I was sitting in a chair last night and you told me you guys were going out west. And she was so angry with me and I was so confused. I just couldn't believe it. Wow. But she thought I eavesdropped. Then I go to school and a couple friends come up to me and I said, oh my gosh, what wasn't that weird last night down at the park? And they're like, Angie, you weren't there. And I really literally thought I was hanging out with my friends down at the park. What? I can... I can picture everything and, you know, we have this beautiful lighthouse and I can just remember it was balmy and the lighthouse looked freaky and, um, yeah. So needless to say that freaked me out and I, so you don't, you didn't have like a consciousness of it while it was happening or you, or you did not know you were astral projecting. You were just, going about your night and your your body was just at home. (laughs) I was out there having a good old time eavesdropping and hanging out at the park, probably at one in the morning. And it just scared me. I thought, my goodness, it wasn't what I expected. Yeah. You didn't get to like fly around the universe. You just kind of kept living just kept doing that you maybe you had some captain crunch or something but it was it was spirit captain crunch it really seemed like i was at like i was in that experience and my my concept of you went to bed you read a book and this is what happened the next day that wasn't even in my mind when i was talking to my mother and to my two friends. Was this first try just you read it and then boom, it happened? Yes. And so then I thought, wow, maybe I could get some powers. (laughs) And I was very obsessed as many of us people on the fringe, as we say. Yeah. I was very obsessed with ghosts and spirits and I wanted to be able to read minds I wanted to be able to tell people's fortunes. Um, I was totally baffled by the whole UFO thing, and I couldn't believe that that many people would have experiences and there wouldn't be some truth to it. So this happened to me, and I thought, wow, I might actually have some powers. You know, maybe I can hone those gifts. And so I set out, well, so then one other thing that happened that was very scary and I actually had, just to be safe, a deliverance over it. We took a Ouija board into the deepest part of the cemetery. Oh, why the cemetery, Angie? (laughs) No. This is like every, that's like the first thing that happens in a horrible horror movie. And you're like, you could just don't go in there. And it's like, yeah, I wonder where we should go. Hey, let's go in the middle of the cemetery. Yeah, that sounds safe and fun. Yeah. So we did this and honestly, nothing happened with, you know, we didn't have the, the thing move around and spell out words. And we didn't see any ghosts or anything like that. But when we got halfway to the gate of the cemetery, the car died. Oh, oh my. Are you serious? Are you not just, are you pitching your screenplay to me right now? Is that what you're doing? No, No, I'm not. (laughs) Because there, I cannot get you a movie deal. I'm just going to say that right now. I wish I had that power, (laughs) but I do not. <laughs> oh, I thought you were connected to people. <laughs> wow. So, Gee, okay. I'm we, sorry. Continue. Yeah. So we're freaking out. Like, literally, we are freaking out. It was me and another wild child friend of mine. And there might have been some marijuana involved. I really can't remember. Oh, what? Teenagers but, in a cemetery without marijuana? No way. Carrying a Ouija board, yeah. 
So uh, my friend, her name was Tammy, was totally freaking out. And I just, and you know, I've, I'm a risk taker and I get myself into situations that I shouldn't because I have always carried a sense of peace in my heart. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, wait, wait, wait. And I just prayed to Jesus. And I said, Jesus, I'm really sorry that we use the Ouija board. And I'm sorry that, you know, I, I pretty much knew this wasn't a good idea. And could you please help us get out of here? <laughs> Isn't that car- how it happens? <laughs> There's no atheists on marijuana in a cemetery with a Ouija board, as the no, as the saying not. goes. <laughs> no, there not. There aren't. So yes, the car started, and we took the Ouija board and tossed it in a garbage can. So Jesus literally then, took the wheel. I believe he did. <laughs> that is awesome. I- so so no no Ouija board stuff anymore no astro travel those two routes did not seem okay and I had a brother who was he was the one that went to juvie Mm -hmm. and he was he was the kind of guy that had long hair and I thought he was a very good looking man yeah he he looked like Jesus there you and go. And he was 12 years older than me, so I was very proud of my big brother. And no matter what horrible things he did, I could totally overlook it. He was Tim, he was cool, he rode a Harley, and he did not give a hoot what anybody thought. <laughs> he and does just, sound cool. How do you, how does he not care? <laughs> So Tim was becoming a Baha'i. Oh, it yeah. Just cool. uh, it the, was cool, like... I was going to say, that's like as far as secular people go and people searching for spiritually, becoming a Baha'i is like the stereotypical cool religion. Is it? Yeah. Nothing is unique. Dang. <laughs> no, no. I, I, I'm loving this. I'm, I'm just connecting those dots, baby. All right. So, you know, I liked the word Baha'i. It was kind of cool. I liked that their God's name was Baha'u'llah because that just sounded kind of cool. <laughs> yeah. And the house where everybody did their firesides was at Dr. Chirac's house. Which sounded so mysterious oh, and wonderful. God. Just another character <laughs> in a movie. Of course, Dr. Chirac, the Baha'i leader. Yep. Yes. And um, so there's two things going on in my life at in this month of my life. There was me searching out a cool religion that I could wrap my hands ar- my mind around. And I really did want to know the truth. I, I felt like I don't know the truth, and you, I must so, know it. Sorry to interrupt, but even after the whole cemetery Jesus take the wheel, even after everything, you're like, "Thanks, Jesus. I'm gonna go check. I'm gonna go to the doc's house and check out yeah. the hole." Yep. Yes, exactly. Wow, isn't um, that interesting? Yeah. How even through everything, we can still. Take the benefits. Jesus will do some great for us, and then we're like, "Thanks, buddy. See you next time." I'm, I'm gonna be trapped in a well with a live tiger next week. If you could just <laughs> schedule that in and help me out, that'd be great. Yes, and Jesus did get me out of a lot of scrapes as a kid, just doing goofy things, um, praying that I wouldn't get killed for it. Yeah, and there were times when I honestly knew. Jesus had my back. And I guess my problem was not so much with Jesus, but with God. Mm. I really felt like God the Father was an unpleasable, angry SOB. Yeah. And I wanted to know, and and we weren't really raised Catholic. I was born Catholic. I had things I had to do as a Catholic in that house, like pray the rosary and 
things like that, but we didn't go to Catholic school and I didn't go to catechism. So I really had no idea what, um, what my religion was about. And I knew that there were so many different religions and I just really sincerely wanted to end up in the right one. Yeah. And I knew that there were a million different Christian denominations and they were so different from each other and, and almost sometimes warring against each other about different things. And it was very confusing. And I just like really wanted to know the truth. Yeah. It can be pretty off putting when, you know, one whole religion can't even agree on, on certain facts. You know, I, I've seen that, but you know, I've seen it time and time again, where just the, the concept of denominationalism and the bickering and the fighting that goes between it can just be incredibly off putting. Yes. To to seekers, to people who want to find and want to be involved. But it's all this like these little nitpickers and, and meanness between the different denominations and things that are just it's you can't it's hard to get past it. It's hard to follow a belief system that believes in peace and turning the other cheek and uh you know, loving thy neighbor when uh, you're busy arguing over if, you know, the wine that Jesus made actually had alcohol in it or not. <laughs> yes. And uh yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. <laughs> I think I think that explains it all. That explains it. Thank you so much. If I do say so myself, I think I wrapped up the entirety of Christianity and its long history of different sects. Yes, although I would love to pick your brain on a few issues, but I think I'll just let God lead me <laughs> to those answers. That's that's a great way to do it. Um Okay, here's some. I just want to make a couple of comments, and maybe we'll just talk a little bit about some of the stuff you've said already. Um, and that you know, with uh, corresponding with sort of the satanic ritual abuse. Now, I know you weren't experiencing necessarily satanic ritual abuse, but I mean, f- f- just on a pragmatic level, you were almost ritually being abused day by day. Um, th- and we find in the different studies and case studies that when there's abuse involved, people do have the ability to sort of click into things such as astral projection and, you know, d- different occult type things and develop, you know, a, a connection with the spiritual world. Um, almost always negative, though. So it's interesting that coming out of this abusive experience, you did you did kind of dabble and had probably more success than most people who try to get into that kind of stuff. Yeah. And I didn't want to say this because my family story is so bizarre anyway, but yeah. my two oldest brothers were, um, they were satanic. Oh boy. And they did things to us, meaning myself and my two younger sisters. Yeah. That, were very horrible. Oh, geez. And and I had a fear of the devil like you wouldn't believe. Wow, I mean, yeah, you, you, yeah, with experiences like that. When I was like, I was, I think, five or six, and I was sent to my room at you know, right at supper time because I was naughty and I really was naughty that day. <laughs> <laughs> and I was, I was in my bedroom and it was dark. I couldn't have the light on. It was dark and it was cold. And I saw a spirit and I could not sleep with a light off for, for probably two or three years. Wow. And, if one of my siblings wanted to really get me, they'd go, white man, white man, <laughs> because I just woke up and there's this white man and he was hovering right over me. Oh, my gosh. He was ugly. And I'm screaming. Well, well that makes it even worse. 
He wasn't even yeah, a good-looking she... crazy spirit man. No, he was hideous. Why couldn't I get a good-looking one? <laughs> but so anyway, yes, I I had my fear of God and wanting to please him and knowing that that was just hopeless. And I had a fear of the devil. And this is part of my, this is the very important part of my story. When I told God to take a flying <laughs> leap, I felt like, okay, okay, now Satan's going to leave me alone. Oh, boy. And so when I was doing my Baha'i faith thing, I was also babysitting for a very wonderful woman who was part of a new church. And she had just become a born-again Christian. And when we would drive to and from the houses, she would pick me up to babysit. She would ask me questions. She was totally witnessing. And um, one day she said to me, you know, we have these Bible studies at our house. Would you, uh, would you want to come to it on, let's say, Monday night? And I said, no, I can't. I'm thinking about becoming a Baha'i and I'm going to Dr. Chirac's house <laughs> for a fireside. <laughs> and she's like, oh, okay, oh. And um, there, the Bible studies were called growth groups. And the growth group prayed for me. And they prayed for me for like a couple months. And Pam kept asking me if I would come to their growth group. And finally, I said yes. And um, I believed in Jesus. There was no doubt. And I believed he was the son of God at that point. And I became, I guess, a born-again Christian at that point. But I honestly think I was a Christian way back when I was a little girl and somebody told me about Jesus, and I just believed it. Wow. And I, I wanted to serve God. But anyway, so I go to this this growth group, and there's just a mixed bag of people, and they're, they're wearing jeans, and they're normal. Some of the guys had short hair. Some had long hair. And so you were know. these, uh, was this a Protestant group, or, or still um, Catholic? No, it was pro Protestant. Okay. And they they would have classified themselves. It was a joke that we were Baptists with a small b. <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't do like the speaking in tongues and stuff like that. Sure. And I don't know. I doubt if anybody would have been opposed to it, but it was just a very Bible based, very simple to follow church. Yeah, they seem like a pretty laid back group. And I went to a lot of Bible studies. I wanted to get my feet in there and really get to know about God. And this church just surrounded me and gave me so much love that it was painful. It was just painful to, to experience love like that because it was so opposite of what I was used to. Yeah. And I would... And I couldn't talk. We, we would be in a group and there, somebody asked a question one time, who's your favorite character in the Bible? And I, I couldn't even say, I don't know enough characters in the Bible to tell you. Today I might say Jesus. You know? <laughs> it's always a good answer. Just just like any any church group or Sunday school, the right answer is always Jesus. Yeah. So anyway, it was really painful and difficult to, to absorb that love. Plus, I was battling with my dad's voice. Oh, I did tell my dad that I joined the church. And then he was angry and said, um, the Catholic Church is the mother church, and anything else is an abomination to God. Ugh. So I'd go, I would go to church. I would say, God, if this is really bad, I'm so sorry, but these people are nice. <laughs> and, and I was just on that quest for truth. Yeah. I, and I, 
And I understood over the years, I understood God's grace. I understood why Jesus died on the cross. Um, Whoa. If you, if you hear all that thunder. Yeah, it sounds like there's a, a tornado over there. There's one in the area, but they never hit my city. <laughs> Wait, that's a real tornado? That is thunder. We're having a severe storm system go through. Uh, <laughs> Wisconsin, middle of- Wisconsin is crazy. So, so anyway, yes, I, I came to believe that it was okay to be part of that church. And I learned enough about the Bible that I could wrap my head around it and understand. But there was a lot of stuff that I didn't understand. Surely. And now, isn't now going back to the love that you talked about that you felt from this group? I mean, I'm always astounded by, uh, you know, and you see it, and it's it's just kind of part of human nature that you know a lot of times in different churches to which I have been too many, um, you know, it, it doesn't really matter really what the theology is being taught. And I'm talking about to a, to a newcomer or a, a, or a new believer or a pre believer, you know, it's sure the teachings might be different from here to there, or maybe a little strange to you if you're hearing it for the first time or, you know, the gospel, you, there's a, there's a couple buys you got to make to, to really grasp onto things. But the community and the love that people show is really the biggest thing. Um, it's the biggest witness and if it kind of sounds like that was uh that was your experience too that was my experience and it was a small church in the beginning there were probably 30 of us and it it grew you know it was i think now it's kind of on the for a small town it's probably like the mega church and what kind of broke my heart was that the more people who came in and the more money people had, the doctrine started to change. That's the interesting. Pa- the original pastor moved away. And then um, we had a couple, we had three pastors before I left the church. Oh, well, that'll certainly change up the doctrine and get a new haun- head honcho yeah. in there. And there were people on the, there were elders who were very wealthy and they were insisting, you know, and not that there's anything wrong with any, you know, whatever, I don't care, but we had ushers who wore jeans and we had this guy on the elder board and I was like a junior elder and we spent an hour arguing about whether ushers should wear suits or not. (laughs) And I gotta say that is not what I was expecting to these changes to be. And it it gets it went from that to very legalistic. That was like the first sign of trouble. And I was sitting at that meeting and I sincerely threw out the question while we were arguing about ushers wearing suits and then we were arguing about Um, how they were going to get enough money out of the church to build more building. Yeah. The old, the old church imperialism. So just, just to be clear, were you on the side of suits or on the side of jeans? Well, I was on the side of jeans and what I told them. Okay. That's what I expected. I just didn't, (laughs) for a second, it sounded like you were (laughs) offended by the jeans. No, I loved the jeans. The first year that the church was running, we met in a gym. Classic. You know, the pastor and his wife were very accessible, very, they were just really wonderful people. And the group of people all seemed to agree on all the same principles. And we didn't worry about external things like 
how big the building was or what people wore. Mm. And I'm at this meeting and there's, and it was a pretty heated discussion. <laughs> and I said, listen, you know, something as important as uh, uh, jeans versus slacks. These are the true theological questions that need to be hashed out for a church to thrive. Yes. <laughs> so I say, Hey, I'm, I'm serious here. Do you think if Jesus was at this table that he would care if ushers wore suits or if they wore jeans? Um, you know, I came into this church a scared, uh, frightened abuse victim, and it was because the usher had a ponytail and wore jeans that I felt like, yes, I'm good enough to be in this church. <laughs> This See, that's, that's, a, that's good church theory right there. You just get the leader and the, the leaders and the staff to just look as grungy and as uh, reprehensible as you can, and then everybody feels safe. Hey, I did not say grungy and reprehensible. <laughs> Those were strong it words. Was... I apologize. <laughs> I, was, I was reaching for the words, and those were a little much. <laughs> Ponytails no. are not reprehensible, everybody. Ponytails no, are totally it chill. Was a, it was a clean ponytail. The jeans were clean. It was just normal. Okay. Like, normal. Yeah. There you go. Normal's like, good. Oh my God. You know, there were guys in suits. There were guys in jeans. There were ladies wearing dresses. There were people wearing not dresses. <laughs> <laughs> was anybody wearing like uh, maybe a... Uh, 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 a downhill skiing ones, onesie. We had one guy and he kept coming like that. And then somebody did pull him aside <laughs> and say, this is a little much. I, you know, I don't there. think Jesus would wear a ski outfit. Now, Steve, Steve, the guy who dresses like a clown every Sunday, that's okay. No, I think a clown would have been frowned upon, too. <laughs> oh, okay. So you did have limits. It wasn't just a total free-for-all. No, it wasn't a free-for-all. It was just... Normal. Normal. Okay. It was welcome. And so that discussion was agreed upon. I should, yes, we're going to wear suits. And then it got to the building discussion. And people were throwing out these crazy ideas like... Well, we need more propaganda. We have to. <laughs> what? And it, they actually and said I, the words propaganda. We need more propaganda. Yes. Now, I and honestly, I was about 25 and I didn't really even know what that meant. Oh, except, so you were kind of a spunky. Sp you're at spunky age. Yeah. And, okay. and I, but I was serious. I was like sincere. I wanted our church to be accessible to everybody. Yeah. I wanted a girl like me at 17 to walk in and go, hey, these people will accept me. Yeah. And when it got to this big heated discussion about how they were going to get people to commit pledges for this new building, I piped up. And I was very serious, and I wasn't smart alecky about it. But I said, "Hey, you guys, don't we believe in the Holy Spirit?" Uh oh. Wouldn't wouldn't the Holy Spirit move people to pledge money if they can afford it? And if we're not getting the pledges, then maybe we're not supposed to have a big church. And I said, "You know, me and my husband." live paycheck to paycheck and as much as I would love to give you all the money I have I can't pledge I can't pledge ten dollars yeah and if somebody comes to my house giving me some speech about serving God and giving above you know tithes and offerings etc I said I would feel shamed and guilty because I can't do it. Yeah. And um, and that's when I just realized that the simple, humble, 
maybe we should say folksiness of the first five years of our church was being lost wow. and, and things, things that I don't think personally that God would have wanted us to be wasting our energy on were taking over and there were doctrinal issues and um, yeah, it sounds like uh, just some priorities in general. It's just some wires started getting crossed there. Yes. And and so I just kind of slowly backed away from the church and went through kind of a dry period where I didn't really, I mean, I wouldn't say I wasn't following I was trying to live my Christian life, but I wasn't really reading my Bible. I wasn't, except for the friends I had made in the church in the early years, I didn't really make Christian fellowship a priority. Yeah. And I, and I slowly, I could see my walk was slowly becoming almost non-existent. Mm. You know, it's interesting because, uh, and and maybe you can confirm this, it seemed like you had finally found what you were looking for, which was this authentic, loving community where people actually kind of seemed like they, you know, believed what they claimed they believed. And having gone through the the, the terrors and your horror uh, movie life up to that point, um, that, I mean, it sounds like had things gotten better? I mean, what... what had you, you know, maybe not like a, like magical Jesus came down and gave you a million dollars, but, you know, having a life where you feel that love and connection. And you said you had a husband at this point, you found a, found a guy, found a man. And it seemed like things, (laughs) things started looking up there for a little bit, at least, you know, and again, just kind of focusing on the emotional part. Had you started to make um, some sort of recovery? Or did that yes. not come until later? Well, it came in stages. But when I first came into the church, the the pain of the love, the inability to receive it without, I, I would get choked up. I would just be like, my throat would clench and I couldn't cry and I couldn't handle it. It was, it it probably Oop. I've been diagnosed with TSD. Hold on one second. It sounds like our connection is uh, getting a little foggy here. Can you say that last sentence again? Um, something about in the early days. Oh, uh, no, that's okay. Hold he... on. Let's do one thing here. <laughs> We're just going to reconnect. I'm going to call you back, see if that fixes it. And, uh, you know, if there's a tornado going through your house right now, that's okay. We can, we can save this for later. But um, uh, let, me give, let me give you a call back real quick, okay? Okay. Okay, here we go. Do, do, do. Calling her back. Trying to not have to edit this because it's really annoying to do. Oh, okay, here we go. Hello, this is Angie. Oh, there she is. She's back and she's clear as a bell. Perfect. Okay, so um, tell me about this PTSD that you were getting. Well, it was a, it was just a very panicky feeling at being loved, mm. at being, you know, an example would be, I would share something at a Bible study, and somebody would say you know, um, you have the gift of discernment and I really love that about you, et cetera, et cetera. And they would hug me and I, and I would be so afraid and I would be like, I don't think I have the gift. And if you really knew who I was and where I've been and, and I did have that, geez, I wasn't raised in a Christian church. I didn't know characters in the Bible. I couldn't tell you what my favorite book of the Bible was when I came in, all that stuff. I was just afraid that once I was exposed, all of that was going to disappear. Wow. Isn't that amazing? 
it's amazing how you know you know theology and doctrine is one thing but it's just giving somebody a compliment giving them a hug is just like the most powerful thing to you at that time it was it was very healing and my friend pam who had br- brought me into the church the woman that i babysat for she would pull me aside and say you know i grew up in a you know in this kind of house and there's certain things i'm seeing in you that i've experienced and she told me about recovery and she told me about counseling and she said there's no shame in having Jesus and needing outside help from counselors. Wow. And eventually I went to, and I really haven't put this in there because it wasn't a big, serious part of my childhood. But when I was about 12, I started to use alcohol, Mm -hmm. mainly for night so I could fall asleep. And then there were two periods in my teenage years where I would drink and drink to the excess of alcohol poisoning. Oh, wow. But then I I wouldn't want alcohol. It wasn't like I drank every day. It wasn't like I was a party girl. And um, yeah, there might have been some pot in the cemetery, but I really didn't even care for pot because it gave us the munchies. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody wants that. <laughs> right. There was an incident. There were a couple incidents where alcohol interfered with my job. And Pam had taken me down for an assessment for alcohol. And I did go into treatment for alcoholism. Mm. But as a 21-year-old alcoholic, I have to say I didn't have a whole lot of war stories, and I really wasn't even sure if I was an alcoholic. Yeah. But I, but I went because alcoholism ran in my family, and it was sort of the think, thinking of, what if I am? Now, uh, maybe 30-plus years has gone by, and I have no doubt that if I was had kept drinking, that I would be dead by now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, with alcoholism comes in a whole lot of different forms, but you know, it and they're all very dangerous and unhealthy. But really, when you even if you don't drink every day, and then just like once a week or one, even once a month, just hit it so hard, like it sounds like you may have been doing having, uh, experiencing, uh, alcohol poisoning. I mean, that's, you got to go pretty hard for that. Yeah, you do. (laughs) 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 And and I was the kind of person that if somebody said, Hey, Ann, do you want a beer? I'd be like, um, a beer. (laughs) And I would look in the fridge and I'd be like, no, that's okay. But if it was party time, oh yeah. Yeah. Because the reason I was going to drink was to get to the feeling that I felt where I could laugh and be happy. Yeah. The first time that I drank beer and felt the feeling that you have that high, I couldn't believe it. I'm like, holy, this this is is great. This is good stuff. I'm going to be doing this as many times as I can. Right. But I was 12 and there was school. (laughs) There was that little detail, that small detail. (laughs) So occasionally I would give in to temptation and go party hardy. But, and being a binge drinker was probably more dangerous to me than if I had just been the normal teenager with a drinking problem that progressed over time. Mm, yeah. But anyway, so my healing started in that recovery, going to a counselor, and I did go to a Christian counselor who understood recovery and post-traumatic stress and all that other stuff. And I started to deal with the grieving of my sister. Oh, wow. And Dec- like a decade later, decades, decade and a half later or something like that. Yes. And so 
there was a lot of spiritual healing and there was a lot of just outside emotional healing and in the recovery community and this was an issue with our church too that always angered me my church did not believe in 12-step programs Ugh. and there were, there were many people who who just for an example the pastor pulled me aside one day and he said i know you're a recovering alcoholic and this person is an alcoholic um, can you help them? And I said, oh, definitely. I can take them to a meeting tonight. You know, and he says, oh, oh, no, no, we don't believe in the 12-step program. Your A doorknob can be your higher power. Oh, my gosh. What is wrong with people? And honestly, Basil, I've been going to AA for 35 years, and I have yet to have anybody say that doorknob is my higher <laughs> power. <laughs> I mean, it, I, I'm familiar with the tenets of AA and, you know, I mean, yeah, I, I can see how somebody would like prefer that somebody's higher power would be God. But a lot of people, it's baby steps. It's all about baby steps. You gotta, it, you gotta like, I mean, just the recognition that there is a higher power is just a wonderful baby step that I think people need to embrace a little bit more. That's true. And what I said to the pastor after I realized that he wasn't going to give me the name of the person, oh, that's I, crazy. Said, so, I said, Hey pastor, Jesus would be at the AA meeting if he was here right now. I don't think he would be at this church. Oh. I think he would be going where the sick people are. And the sick people need Jesus. Yeah. So I have no shame in attending 12-step recovery because I carry the message of my creator and my God. And hopefully by my example and by my peace and serenity through difficult times hopefully people recognize that the higher power that i was following was a higher power who loved me yeah and i've sponsored a lot of people and brought them you know was part of the process not you know i didn't bring them to god but i helped them to find Jesus. Yeah, you were you were a team player, as we should all be. That's just incredible. That that uh ooh, ooh, getting heated over here. Just telling people not to attend twelve step programs because Ugh, okay. All right. Okay. Those people believe your higher power can be a doorknob. And I'm like, no, <laughs> nope. they don't. No, they do not. <laughs> But but even to, like, just the concept of keeping somebody away from something that can, A, save their life in a, in a physical way, and just because, I mean, they don't claim to be a Christian uh, group, I believe, right, no. AA, they don't claim that. But a lot of, I mean, a lot of it is pretty, pretty jesus followy. If you ask me. Well, I follow the 12 step program and there's nothing in that process that troubles my soul. Yeah. yeah. I do a step 10 at night, which, you know, we say it's a step 10 where I review my day. Yeah. And what, what could I have done differently? And it keeps me in touch with the fact that I need God every day. Yeah. Well, that's and good. So, Enough of me being infuriated by your uh, former pastor. We can move forward now. I've got it out of my system. Be mad, mad Basil. <laughs> <laughs> so, so were you still at that church at the time? Is that So that's how that came about? You were still kind of hanging around that church, or was this a different church? No, it was the same church. It was like my only church was this particular church. Yeah. And 
something would be a red flag. And then I would just tell myself, well, that's those people. And I had a very good core group of people that were all sort of on the same page. That's good. And slowly but surely, it just didn't resemble the church that I started with. Yeah. And, and that, I, can, that can be kind of sad. It's almost a it's almost a death of a friend or something when something like that happens. It was sad. And I didn't really allow myself to feel that until, and this is like really a gap, but um, I had opened a small business in the part of Wisconsin I love to live in, which is this county called Door County. Yeah. And it was a good excuse not to attend church. <laughs> and I, <laughs> so I'll just be clear. Ten years, no church, not much Bible reading. I did pray. I did try to be an example of God's kingdom. But a lot of what we call character defects were creeping in and I wasn't seeing it. Mm, interesting. And then I started working for a lady who was who is a Christian and we started going to church up north and that's when I realized how much I missed it. Yeah. Just walking in the door and people being happy to see you and listening to an inspirational message. Yeah. So and then so uh, let uh, with the counseling thing, you want to talk about counseling a little bit here? Because sure. because it I feel like a lot of people may be a little bit like your your former pastor um in that, you know, we do have Jesus and we do have God and he is our healer and our counselor and our uh, all that good stuff. And so, you know, uh, I I don't I don't blame people who say like, well, I don't need counseling or I don't need to talk about this or I don't need to do any of these things because, you know, I have Jesus and he's going to fix everything. And while that is true, I mean, you got to have somebody give somebody Jesus to work with. I mean, it's it's. I don't know. And I don't think it's necessarily has to be counseling, but to review, to refuse the <laughs> the goodness that can come out of counseling, especially, you know, Christian counseling and uh, when they're able to relate and, and minister you, to you in that way, what, what, for whatever it's for, if it's for alcohol or if it's for PTSD or if it's for uh, some emotional problems you're having, I mean, God works through that type of stuff. He does, and I look at counseling as you know, all those prayers I prayed as a child to be better and to be able to do God's will. And then now I'm an adult and I'm trapped in these behaviors that I can't control and people are trying to love me and I can't stand being touched or praised. The counseling helped me chip away at what it was yeah. that needed healing. Yeah. And Jesus definitely, or God, Jesus, however you want to put it, I was definitely led into counseling. And my, I had three specific ones and one counselor would take me as far as they had the experience. And then I would move on to a new counselor. They all were godly people and they all, um, helped. Yeah. And I think part of it too is, you know, people who are not so hot on counseling, you know, they, they think like, oh, you're taking it into your own hands or you're putting it into another human's hands. But that's a, that's a mistake to think that because God's right there with you. It's, it's not just you and the counselor, it's you and the counselor right. and God, and you're all working together to uh, get to the bottom of the situation. And so, yeah, of course you don't want to put your, the fate of your emotional life in the hands of a human being alone. But when you got Jesus there tag teaming, that's the way to go right there. 
Yeah, and I look at counseling like going to school. Mm -hmm. When you're raised in an abusive home and you're not taught boundaries, you're not taught how to resolve conflict, your self-esteem is beaten down and you feel unworthy, those feelings are going to come into your adult life and the kind of adult you're going to be is going to be dependent upon whether you get that training that we were supposed to have as children. Yeah. There you go. So, you know, you can't come to Jesus and know everything, you know, how to read, write, and do calculus. You have to go (laughs) to school. (laughs) And you come to Jesus and Jesus will use the wisdom of the counseling because it's, it's, it's just psychology. It's, it's you just, know, no it's just understand, or it's just trying to discover what's going on within you. And a lot of it is a lot of times we don't, a, we don't make the choice to look inward and figure out things, why we do the things we do or why we feel the way we feel. Um, but then it's it's also being mindful and having the tools to not just withstand the revelation of those things inside of us, but also to start working on them. Exactly. Yeah. So so that's great. Now we are coming up. Uh, we're we're about an hour and twenty minutes in. This is flying by, Angie. I'm loving this. So um, uh, I'm gonna let you finish the thought that you're on. And then let's uh, let's talk a little bit about. Um, well, I, I want to talk. I want to hear about the success of this counseling, and and where it brought you, and and of course it's all a continuing story in all of our lives. Uh, but I want to also hear uh, maybe how you how how you if and how you heard about uh, some of the ways that the world is working that a lot of people don't know about, if you know what I mean. I know what you mean. (laughs) I knew you would. So the the counseling, it's just, I'm all for it. I believe God provides that. And I hope that if you're out there listening and you have shame because Jesus didn't miraculously take away your anger or your terror of abandonment, whatever issues you have as an adult, it's okay to go get help for that. And if you're addicted, it's okay to go to AA. You take Jesus in there with you. <laughs> hey, I like that. And, um, uh, I guess just that there's no shame in being a broken person. Yeah. And for so many years, I felt ashamed because I was broken and I needed so much healing. And... Today, I have so much gratitude. And I also want to say, you don't have to have my story Mm. to qualify for counseling. Gosh, that is good. That is real good. You know, you're you're a smart lady, Angie. Thank you. (laughs) All right. (laughs) Oh, go ahead. So, okay, so I left church go. I kind of dabbled back and forth. I've been churchless for a long time. And now getting to the topics that Christians don't discuss. Oh, that you didn't um, hear in that church you were at. How, no. How did you start to discover that there are things, uh, things were not as they seemed in this physical plane of ours? Well... I did a lot of studying. I'm kind of a research junkie. And oh. I I would just I would look for I'd go online and I would look up things about ghosts. Um the the TV that was just coming out, the ghost hunters and the ghost adventures. I would watch it because I was intrigued and I wondered what is all that. Right. And then watching shows about UFOs and listening to people tell their story and really thinking to myself, something happened to those people. 
And I would ask my pastors or even my Christian friends about um, spiritual warfare, about evil spirits, about what they thought UFOs were. And pretty much the discussion was we don't need to worry about those things. Um, And maybe that's true, but I wanted to know what's going on. I just had to know. And one night I was flipping through YouTube and I found a video that said aliens come from hell. And I watched it. Oh, did I? Oh, I said hell. Oh, no. (laughs) No, No, it's just there. You just went. There you go. Straight to the heart of the matter. That's a very aptly named video. So I watched the video and I'm not saying any person on YouTube is 100 percent. Correct. Imagine that. But I watched. Isn't that weird? We're (laughs) all like still learning. But it really woke me up. I'm like, of course they're evil spirits. Of course they're fooling us. Of course. Yeah. And then the things like the psychics with their um, spirit guides, it all kind of clicked. And I'm thinking, wow. And I don't know. I think just going through YouTube at one point... I came across um, the sharpening, I think, Josh Peck. Yeah, the sharpening report. And I was just floored by what I was learning. And I was feeling so grateful that finally I had some answers that made sense. Nice. So shout out to Josh Peck for, for getting this one. And then, and I have to tell you this, Baz, (laughs) there was one episode where there was this weird guy wearing this weird mask, (laughs) and I'm like, I don't know if I want to, that guy looks like a dork. (laughs) 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 But I did. That is hilarious. You killed me. (laughs) I, I, I do various types of work where I'm by myself a lot, and I was... At that point, I was working on this farm, weeding. It was for an organic farm. And I'm out in the field laughing my head off like a fool. (laughs) Just something silly. And I thought, hmm, I better check out this Canary Cry Radio. So I pretty much had to have to admit, I OD'd on Canary Cry, Josh Peck, and other other podcasters. Yeah. And I did hit a brick wall where all of a sudden I was depressed. Mm, and yeah. And then when you had mentioned about the Joyce Spiracy theory, I just thought, oh my gosh, thank goodness I'm not the only person that like is starting to feel like why even bother why get out of hell why go to work yeah the illuminati is gonna just you know we're being taken advantage of and we're slaves and um i've i've been waiting for the truck to come and put me into a um (laughs) in the loony bin (laughs) oh yeah in FEMA. fema camp you're right you know it's interesting uh it's, this is a great example with Josh, which first, Josh, Pesh, Josh Peck, formerly from the Sharpening Report, now he's over at Skywatch TV, great friend, uh, friend of the shows and also personal friend. I mean, he's a goofy guy, and, you know, I, I've been told that I, too, am a goofy guy, but you get us together, and it's just, no, nothing gets done. It's just I've too much. I've experienced it. <laughs> I've, I, I was in that, I listened to that three hour episode. Of <laughs> Every time I've been on the air with Josh, it's just the f- most fun ever, but it also, <laughs> you know, it's, that's, uh, it's, it's hard to get any work done there. Um, but you know, it's, it's nice to hear that because 
in in this crazy thing we call podcasting, really, for the most part, all you can do is just make it or do the thing and talk for a couple hours and then post it, and you really don't know if anybody ever hears it. Or if they hear it, you never know if they like it or they don't like it, unless they're leaving reviews or something, which 99.9% of people don't. And yes, this is me guilting everybody into leaving ratings and reviews uh, for this show and every other show that you listen to. Um, yes. but. Well, you should. Yes, but it's you know it's it's great to hear that that actually that that particular silly silly time uh, you know actually somebody actually listened to it so that's great thank you very much. You're welcome, <laughs> and I'm sure many people have. And I've <laughs> I've given the info to different friends of mine that I guess if I had to say what I'm grieving for now mm-hmm. is community with people who who are aware of these things and we can talk about those things, pray about those things. I kind of feel a little bit alone. Yeah. Um, I talked to my husband and and he totally gets it and understands it, but he thinks I'm a little bit wacko. <laughs> No matter what's going on, I'm like, oh, that's satanic. Oh, that's the Illuminati. <laughs> yeah, when you're able to start spotting Illuminati symbolism in almost everything you see everywhere ever, it does start to make people think that you uh, <laughs> went a little bit overboard. And, you know, I, and to be fair, I mean, that's by design. Uh, they want they want uh, people who are able to do that to be discredited. But don't worry, I'm here. I understand you, Angie. We're in a safe place. We can talk about we can talk about that new Katy Perry video and and everything in it, <laughs> and nobody will think we're crazy here. <laughs> oh my gosh! So well, you were that- so you were starting. Sorry to interrupt again, but you so you were starting to um starting to wake up to some things. So UFOs, that's what got you into it. That was your first foray. I'm always interested in, in what the first step for people were into uh, the, the steep decline into, you know, the crazy truths about the world. Right. And when you're, when you are being taught that UFOs are evil spirits, and that they're tricking people, and they're taking people and doing things to people for and and then it's fallen angels and it's like well that makes sense right and it it is just like this big thing that starts to unravel and pretty soon i guess for myself pretty soon what i'm realizing is all i really have is god yeah and my family and my circle you know the people i love yeah and, and your dogs. And my dog. <laughs> and I have to tell you this, Basil. I wanted you to mention my dog Enzo when I first became a Patreon Joy Spiracy Theory person. Yes. And he finally, he gave up. He couldn't wait. And he had to go. He's in heaven now. Oh, <laughs> Enzo. Well, oh, yeah. I forgot about that. We had scheduled beforehand a different interview, and then Enzo passed away. I'm very yeah. sorry to hear about that. Well, yeah, we, we will, we will definitely, I... we will definitely give him a shout out, and uh, he he is the official sponsor of this episode, and um, we will we will thank very you very cool. much, Enzo, and. I'm sure he will be listening to this on however they listen to podcasts in heaven. That's right. <laughs> and uh, dogs could go to heaven. Y- yes, but of I'll course. But okay if they don't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not that crazy, but no, um, it's, yeah. it's it's still up in the air. We we don't, there's no firm firm uh, biblical standard to say that they don't. So we'll just find out when we get there. Um. So how about this? Um, before I 
got so interrupty. We are kind of talking about the upswing. So you had learned about this. I'm sure it went from UFOs. I'm sure the Illuminati got in there, especially if you uh, listen to Canary Cry Radio or watch Gonza's movie, Age of Deceit, Age of Deceit 2. Find it on YouTube, everybody. There you go. It's the good <laughs> stuff. I, I've just given in to just constantly buzz marketing his video because I love him and I love his work. <laughs> And he's a good friend, and he pays me $7,000 every time somebody mentions it on this program. Um, that last part's not true, but I will start charging him if it continues. Uh, so, the upswing. You, you felt the classic, the classic uh, depression that comes after learning about all this stuff. And... I, you know, I, I don't wish it upon anybody, but if you're a listener to this show and you have not experienced that deep, dark hole that you can find yourself in, um, even though you love Jesus, even though you go to church, even though everything, when you start learning about the truth of the world and the supernatural and the, the powers that control and the elites and everything, um, it's kind of hard not to, not to get on that downswing. So I'm very happy to learn that this show was at least part of your upswing, but take me a little bit more through that through that journey. Well, I would be driving around in my car and thinking, uh, there's so much evil. How do we even, like, how do I live? How... Who can I trust? Yeah. Where Where is the goodness? I guess that was the thing is, where is the safe haven? Where is the goodness? Mm. There, Because in my mind, before being enlightened to the truth, as I believe it is, Satan was so small, and his dominion over the earth meant nothing to me. Mm. And then it became real yeah. and I realized there is a spiritual battle and it is so much bigger than I thought it was. And we have enemies all over. But then one day I thought, and I've managed to live to be 53. <laughs> <laughs> you made it this far. I have, I have Jesus. And even if the worst of the worst happens, I know where I'm going. Yeah. And now my fear is just, God, how can I, how can I minister around those issues? And am I supposed to? Yeah, that's a, that is actually a wonderful second part to that question. Am I supposed to? That's a question not as many people ask as they should i think i was um on the the episode that will be coming out right before this one uh i was talking to uh, johnny iron from the johnny show from the iron show which has not come out yet so you're actually the first listener to know about this um but you know with the advent of technology and just sort of the i think it's an american thing too where we all we all kind of think that we are the saviors of the world. You know, we may love Jesus, but we all kind of think that like we're the one, the one hero who will save everything and take down the NWO and shoot the the UFOs from the sky with our good American-made shotguns. Um, you know, everybody does have a different mission. And and different parts to play in other missions as well. And I'm not here to tell anybody what their mission is and is not, but um, I think it's a very important question that even people like myself who have programs and, and things like this, it's a good question to ask that, you know, God, is, is, is this, am I supposed to be the one who does this or one of the people who do this? And, you know, you can always tell when when somebody may not have asked that question <laughs> you know you sometimes you don't even really know how but you'll you'll be absorbing somebody's content in one way or another and sometimes it's just like i don't know if you've really been charged with this mission <laughs> 
<laughs> and I, I do not at all mean anybody in particular. But, um, you know, I got to ask myself that sometimes. Yes, and I'm the kind of person who errs on the side of caution. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't bring things up. And I'm starting to wonder, hmm, does God want me to bring these things up? Yeah. And a, lot of, and a lot of times it's situational, too. Like it may not be standing on a street corner with a sign, but God will bring you the right people and present the right opportunities that are tailored to just your personality, to your experience, to your uh, level, and to your area of knowledge. And... Um, you know, those are really the opportunities we should all be looking for. That's a very good point. I can just ask God to send me people as he sees fit. <laughs> 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 Whenever I've thought about sharing it, I just think I would just be babbling, Illuminati, aliens, <laughs> the Trimineral <laughs> Committee, um, evil spirits, Nephilim, Nephilim, oh Nephilim, Nephilim. <laughs> uh, you know, and I'm, you know, I guess I have a question. Sometimes I get fearful about like the mark of the beast. Yes. What will that be? Yeah. And I think, um, Will God protect me so that I know not to get an implant to cure right. my cancer or, you know, however that's going to work? It's just very scary. Yeah, you know, it is. And as somebody who's been talking with, uh, you know, people who think about this a lot and have written books and have... Uh, you know, published materials and movies and have devoted their life to figuring that out. The one thing that I've learned is that nobody's got it figured out. <laughs> but the, <laughs> but the, the greatest thing that I've learned here and, you know, is that God wouldn't put us in a situation that tricks us into it without there being a tell. You know, I think, who was I talking to? Uh, well, I'm just not even going to name a name because I don't want to forget the real person and I don't want to give somebody else credit. But it's, um, you know, the fact that uh, we're not going to be tricked, you know, a firm Bible-believing uh, Jesus follower who has received salvation is not going to be tricked unwillingly into, you know, the mark of the beast or, or really anything like that that you want. It's not going to be, we're not going to slip on a banana peel and land in hell. Um, I think whatever it is, I think whatever it is, it's going to, uh, we're going to know it when we see it. So you, that is a relief. <laughs> I'm sorry to interrupt. What was that? <laughs> that is a relief. And I think I interrupted you. No, that's and okay. Before I, forget, before I forget to apologize to any listeners out there, I know that I say, um, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. This is a safe place. Everybody here knows, uh, you know, we're all just making our own way through the world. And, you know, if I had a little bit more time on my hands, I could go through and edit everybody into sounding like a brilliant scholar. But, you know, I think it's uh, it's part of the fun to, uh, you know, part of the fun of this show is hearing people in an authentic way who are just like us. And, uh, you know, it's taken me years to cut out just a fraction of the ums that I say all the time. So you're safe. <laughs> oh, thank goodness I'm not alone. Yeah. And I do, I do want to thank you for having this new format because it really has been so fun to listen to the interviews and to hear the stories, and I laugh, and I'm inspired, and I get new ideas, and maybe because everybody wasn't super perfect in how they expressed themselves, I thought, you know, I have a story, and maybe I would be okay. <laughs> yeah, you have a great story, and you've been awesome. Um, 
And yeah, you know, I'm really glad to hear that because as much as I, I got to say, and this is to you and all the other listeners and listeners in the future who are going to come on the show and uh, anybody I get on, you know, I love the people. I love the people who are professionals and they write books and they research and they do all this and they have other podcasts and they have other books and everything. I love them so, so dearly. Um, but this, this show to me has been such a blessing that not just to have more time to spend with them, but to, to hear everybody's stories. It's just been, it's, it's been world opening to me personally. And just in the short amount of time I've been doing this show, it's, it's caused so much growth just in myself. So I want to thank you and all the other listeners who come on. And it's, it sounds kind of corny for me to be thanking everybody like that and thanking you especially, but it's, it's really true. It's, I've, I think maybe I've gotten more out of this show than uh, anybody else. So, so you are helping me here, Angie, and I thank you for that. And you are welcome. <laughs> so let me help each other. <laughs> yes. Let me help you. Help me help you. Help me. Yes. Mostly me though. <laughs> um so okay, so here we go. We're on the home stretch. We're at about an hour and forty five minutes. But that's okay. And um so I want to know a little bit kind of about some tips and tricks you got going on in your life now that have you know, been kind of helping you remind you what's important, remind you that, you know, not all is lost and uh, to kind of keep your head above water. Cause you know, I think everybody's got a little tips and tricks that help, you know, we talk a lot about, and don't you think for a second, we're not going to talk about your dogs and, and juicing. Those are definitely <laughs> going to be in there. Um, but what does that look like for you? For me, it's a daily inventory. First, I look at myself and I ask God to give me the wisdom if I've screwed up to make things right and being feeling like I have a clean slate. And I would say mostly like my husband and my children, it, it makes me feel good. Mm. And then I write a gratitude list every night. And I have a friend that I've been calling for years. And if she thinks it's not long enough, she makes me continue. <laughs> and it'll be, it'll be like, I'm grateful I have running water. I'm grateful I live in a house. I'm grateful my eyes work, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And listening to all you guys, and, you know, and I don't want to sound like I'm sucking up, but listening to the people who have shared on your show has really lit a fire for me to get back into the Bible. Mm. And I spend probably um, as consistently as I can a half hour and I listen to it and I'll sit and I'll listen to it. i follow along and I'll read, but audio I like Bible. It. Yep. Nice. And, and that gives me a sense of connection to God. And I guess just in my heart, I know that, that God is in charge of all this. Yeah. Yeah. I like that a lot. I mean, it's really something, it's it's tough. And I'll say this because, you know, I'm right there with everybody. We've all gone through this. And, you know, we all know that God's in charge. And, you know, even theologically, we can recognize that. But it really is a daily practice to let that fact really sink in, that God is in charge. And, you know, life is going to have its ups and downs and some more than others, but to really have that and remind yourself every day and really pray and meditate on the fact that God really is in charge and he does want the best for us. And it may not look like what we think it should look like. Um, and this is individually as well as the world as a whole, but, um, you know, keeping that in mind and, and really focusing on that and reminding ourselves and looking for hints uh, everywhere in life and having that really sink into our heart 
you know, really have that, uh, that foundation, um, have that seep into our heart. And, you know, when that starts to be more than just a platitude and just something you sort of say when bad things happen, when that sinks in enough, um, it's really, it's such a freeing thing. There's so much freedom and there's so much joy in that. And, you know, that really would be, I, you know, I, I hate to reveal the, the secrets of life here this early in the, <laughs> in the game, but I mean, that's really been one of the biggest things for me that, uh, you know, f- finding ways to have that fact become a reality in the innermost part of my soul has um, it's done wonders. And it sounds like it's done wonders for you as well. Yes, I would say the past two years that I've been seriously listening on the podcasts and, of course, Canary Cry and this one, my two favorites. Woo-hoo. But I feel that. I feel that... Um. knowing more of the truth has brought me closer to God. Mm. And, and a, a Christian walk that was very dead and a belief in God that was just kind of turning into something very bland, it's changed. And I thank God that and and I will admit, okay, I'm a little addicted to YouTube. <laughs> and I, I can be up way too late watching videos. And they were usually goofy videos. Like, I'm really watching this about this rock star, like, for the 10th time. <laughs> <laughs> when I hit the truth, the Christian truth topics, um... I lost my train of thought, but it just, it, it changed my spiritual walk Yeah, and it, it made God real. Yeah. And I think a lot of, I think that's so re that's so right. And that's so real too. And I think a lot of people are experiencing the same thing. And I think that's why a lot of times, you know, uh, an attack on us from the enemy does come at that time. You know, when you start to learn too much you know, there are, you know, there is that period where I think you hit sort of a critical mass and then, uh, you know, the enemy's just like, all right, how about you deal with some sadness about it all? Maybe that'll get you off the track. And uh, <laughs> and I really think that pushing through that is like a world-changing, life-changing, uh, you know, uh, just cosmologically uh, impactful moment. So there you go. And now, unless you have something you just have to get out so badly right now, I want to hear about your doggies. Alrighty. I have two dogs. Nice. And one is a big dog. His name is Chance. And you formerly had three. And so I want to hear about Enzo as well because he deserves it. He does. He was such a good little buddy. Well, um, Enzo was a little rat terrier. He was black and brown. Aww. We called him. We called him the ninja. <laughs> he could. He could literally kill rats, <laughs> and often did <laughs> with karate and ninja stars. Yes, he could jump so high. <laughs> he was. He was very antisocial. Mm-hmm. He was a rest dog. But he was such a little lover, and my husband is the master dog dad as far as dog dads out there. If I die, I would prefer to come back as Dan's dog. <laughs> <laughs> because he, he takes really good care of him, and it was very hard for Dan. Um, Enzo had a tumor, and he woke up one day just unexpectedly very disoriented Mm -hmm. and in pain and we took him that day and had him put to sleep and i'm grateful that he didn't suffer yeah and he was 13 so yeah he gave us a lot of years of his life 
And then his little brother, Zeke, is another rat terrier. And he's hilarious. He <laughs> is insane. He's got jokes. He, can, he does. He, he is hilarious with jokes. <laughs> he can make you laugh with a piece of fuzz. <laughs> he he's just great so i love him for the humor that he brings and then there's chance who is another rescue dog and he was crazy and i thought why why did i <laughs> dog? we why? all we all occasionally <laughs> think that about all of our pets why do i even feed you what are you I used to have a couch, and now it's just a, a ball of fluff and nothingness. Exactly. This dog could bite off his harness. <laughs> There's nothing he can't chew apart. There's nothing. <laughs> a clong. He's got it. The, the dog has teeth. But he has mellowed out his post-traumatic stress from his past life is over he's now five years old and he is just a great dog and he lays under the table when I'm listening to the podcasts and doing my painting or whatever else I might be doing and he's just a buddy so he's my presence of goodness Zeke is my little hilarious clown <laughs> and when we put Enzo down I started thinking ooh. Ooh, uh -oh. puppy. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> but we're going to hold off. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, let's see how long that lasts. If God would happen to put a rescue dog in my path, I'm not going to say no to it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good attitude. Oh, well, that's that's wonderful. And uh, so we thank you three, what was it, Enzo, Zeke, and Chance? Yep. Okay. Well, Very thank you. I know, I was just I was so worried I was going to get it wrong. Um, so thank you, wonderful three doggies, for sponsoring this episode. And Enzo, we remember you fondly and we love you. And uh, now let's hear let's hear about let's hear about that fitness girl. Are you uh, <laughs> you taking you taking walks? You what do you what do you, what do you what does that look like? Well, you, you're doing that P90X. You on that CrossFit kick? Oh my gosh, my husband is. Really? My husband is 61, and the crazy man jogs 10 miles a day. Wow. And he does the TV. He does everything. And I have to, I was thinking now, am I going to be honest with Basil, or am I going to show I always appreciate when the, when the guests are, are just brutally honest about their own situation. <laughs> I joined a gym, Anytime Fitness. I do love it. That's a good when start. I, go, I do go there, but um, it's been slacking off. Mm -hmm. So I would have to say that, like, um, you ask people if they do the juicing. My husband juices. Yeah, dance. I, he sounds like he's on top of it. Yeah, he's more together. He's the sane one of the two of us. <laughs> but... I do follow a, a meal plan and I do eat a lot of veggies and my proteins are bacon and cheese. <laughs> well, <laughs> see, if, if you eat enough veggies, then you're allowed to eat all the bacon and cheese you want. At least that's, exactly. that's my diet plan. So I'm not at my fit best, but I do, I, I really, I have a two year old granddaughter and oh yeah, I want I want to be able to get up off the floor without grabbing onto the couch, <laughs> <laughs> or Dan having to come pick you up or drive yeah. the crane in. Dan, help! <laughs> Pull me up. So, um, it's last fall, and this this I can give you guys credit for too. You had Byron Rogers on. Oh yeah. I was listening to that episode of Canary Cry, and he just inspired me. I was like, yeah, what am I doing? <laughs> my health. What? 
and I'm not sure what he said or how he said it, but it just inspired me that I have to take my physical fitness into, I have to make that a priority. Yeah. I would say I'm 75% there. Hey, well, like we said before, baby steps. And that's that's awesome that Byron got you pumped. I'll, I'll let him know that. <laughs> yeah, and I actually let him know that because that was that was key. I was in a very bad funk about wanting to stay in bed all day unless I had to go to work. <laughs> well, that's awesome. I'm sure he loved that, didn't he? He loved it, <laughs> yeah. He, he's cool like that. <laughs> yeah, he's a cool dude. Well, great. I'm glad. You know, I got to say, you may not you may not be the most excited to have shared that, but, you know, that's that's inspiration right there. You're doing what you can, and you're doing the best you can with what you got, and uh, you know what? That's, that's just fine by my book. That is good. <laughs> I want to be fine by your book. I also do want to tell you the last episode that I listened to because I repeat them Mm -hmm. so I know what to expect. When you were saying the system, (laughs) I was I was laughing so hard. I made my husband come up from the workout room and listen to it. (laughs) (laughs) The system. And he's like, oh, my gosh, there's people just like you out there. I have beat that to death. I have looked for reasons to say the system. Don't be part of the system. (laughs) That'll be the new catchphrase. Uh, Well, Angie, thank you so much. This has just been such a wonderful experience, and I'm very happy that we finally got to connect. And, uh, you know... You know, I I gotta say, you you might be one of the first uh, one the, one of the first Wisconsin Wisconsin tights. How do you say it? What are people I from Wisconsin? I say Wisconsinite. Wisconsinite. Okay, that's good. I like that. But I might have made that up. I'm not sure. That's okay. It's <laughs> now official. It is now the state, the official state name for people. <laughs> Yeah, we're going to get that into the system. Into the system. Changing the system. <laughs> All right, Angie. <laughs> thank you so much. This has been okay. so great. Is if there's anything left on your heart, I don't want to let I don't want you to lose your chance. But uh but otherwise, if not, thank you so much and uh you you'll be you'll be able to listen to your own voice on the podcast. Yikes. Yeah. Okay, well thank you Basil. You made it very easy. So if there's other listeners wondering if they should do this, it's not that hard. <laughs> there you go. You're a good interviewer. And if I talk too much, people, I apologize. No, nah, it's but all thank good. You. You're and so good welcome. Night. Good night, Angie. Thank you very much, Angie, for coming on the show. And thank you all for listening. What a, what just a, what, I'm just constantly astounded by the stories and the lives of the people that I have on this show. I, it's, it's very much a, a privilege for me to talk to everybody here. And speaking of which, if you would like to be on an episode of the Joy Spiracy Theory, just go ahead and hit me up. Hit me up on uh, Facebook. Basil Rosewater. You can hit me up on my email, uh, basil.rosewater at gmail.com, or you can hit me up at the Joyspiracy Theory at gmail.com. Do those. We'll get you in here. We are currently scheduling for a bunch more episodes. So if you've been wondering, maybe I should do it, maybe I shouldn't, you definitely should. So just just do it. There you go. All right. Thank you, Patreon people. Again, it was Melissa, Jen, Benjamin, Tommy, Cody, Tom, Natalie, Sam, and Clara who uh, are new donors or upgrading donors. And I'm just so, so blessed by all of you. If you would like to support the Joy Spiracy Theory on Patreon, go to patreon.com slash the Joy Spiracy Theory. You can sign up for really any amount of monthly support you'd like. Or at $5, you can have your furry friend sponsor a show. It's great. They'll get their names read. And if there's... One thing I know dogs and cats and and all sorts of the animal kingdom like is that they love getting shout-outs on podcasts. And for $10, you can get a 100-word message read on the show. Maybe you got friends or family, or maybe you got to tell somebody about your new website. This is a great place to do it. And it's only $10 a month. I mean, holy smokes, what a great deal. 
All right. Remember, everybody, we got the, the Joy Spiracy prayer group going. You can email uh, tjtprayer at gmail.com. Oh, man. I hope I got that right. I'm going to check that. Um, also, we got Facebook. Like us on Facebook. Leaving us a rating and a review on iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you listen to us is a great way to get the robots to tell people about the show. So please leave a rating. Like five stars. Like one star is like, oh, Basil uh, t- t- extracted all of my teeth. That's bad. Five stars is like, Basil gave me more teeth. I have so many teeth now. Thanks, the Joy Spiracy Theory. <laughs> Oh, that's a good one. And a review is just that. You know, telling people how much teeth you have now. <laughs> okay. All right. You know, here's one thing. I have a speak pipe. You go to speakpipe.com or you go to the joyspiracytheory.com and there's a little tab on the right-hand side and you can leave a voice message for me. Now, here's the thing. I'm considering getting rid of this feature because not a lot of people are doing it. But... There is one person who has been so consistent with this speak pipe service and leaving me messages. But, I mean, I'm just going to say it right here on the show. They're not very helpful messages, <laughs> but they are impromptu songs about the Joy Spiracy Theory. This person is submitting them anonymously, so I, I have nowhere to direct my, <laughs> my, I don't even know. It was, it, it was confusion, and I think it is still confusion. Um, but I figured since nobody else is leaving speak pipe messages, this guy gets his awesome songs on the podcast. So if you wait all the way till the end, past the ending music, you can listen to what I have to deal with on pretty much a weekly basis uh, with the speak pipe, <laughs> speak pipe service. Maybe I'll just give everybody the opportunity to just go there and sing songs about the Joy Spiracy Theory. Maybe that's what it's for. So you can do, you can leave me a cool song on the Joy Spiracy Theory. Sing it, hum it, whistle it, yell it, do whatever you want to do. Go to the joyspiracytheory.com. On the right-hand side, there'll be a little little tab pops out for uh, leave a voice message, and that's where you can do it. Okay. All right, everybody. Well, thanks for listening to the Joy Spiracy Theory. And remember, when you're camping in a park and there's bugs in your shoe, you just uh, start doing a little dance and uh, toot-de-toot-toot. I'm pretty sure I've ended another one with tooty toot toot, so that's slowly becoming the ending line. Anyways, <laughs> catch you later. Joy, 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 just miss it, baby. Joy, 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 spiracy theory. It's a joy spiracy theory. Joy spiracy theory. Joy, joy, joy. It's a joy spiracy theory. I'm so joyful. I'm so joyful because it's the joy, 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 joy spiracy theory. Come and sing with me. It's a joy spiracy theory. Joy, 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 joy spiracy theory. Come and sing with me. Joy, 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 joy spiracy theory. Theory. It's a joy, 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 joy spiracy theory. Theory. It's a joy spiracy theory. Theory. Joy Spiracy Theory coming at you from afar. Joy, 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 Spiracy Theory. Do, 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 joy Spiracy Theory. Joy, 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 jo